audience, because I know there's a fuller uh, seating over there, will uh, we'll be quiet when they enter here, because we would like to go ahead and, uh, and begin this afternoon. Oh. Mm -hmm. So welcome to the afternoon session, which will consist of one panel and then a pair of responses uh, by our conference organizers, Christine Olson and Christine Kleinhans. So we thank you in our hearts and as each step as we go along. It's been a wonderful symposium uh, so far, and symposium truly around the meal and conversation. Uh, again, we look forward to more of that at the end of the day, and to whatever hour <laughs> souls depart from Boston God, we can enjoy some really nice time together. Uh, and I look forward to enjoying a bit more of you. I've been kind of stirring the background. It's all very satisfying. So, our afternoon panel session is titled The Poem as Inspiration for Self Reflection Inside and Outside the Classroom. And we have three professor teacher panelists here with us this afternoon. So, uh, we'll follow the same format as earlier. I'll introduce uh, each one in turn and uh, we'll save questions uh, for the panelists uh, collectively at the end. So, first we have Sherry Rausch, who is professor of Italian at Penn State University and author of Speaking Spirits, Ventriloquizing the Dead in Renaissance Italy from the University of Toronto Press in 2015. Uh, also, Hermes Liar, Italian poetic self-commentary from Dante to Tommaso Campanella, also the Toronto Press 2002. She is co-editor with Christelle Baskins of the Medieval Marriage Scene, Prudence, Passion, and Policy, Arizona State University Press 2005. She's also co-editor or editor and translator of the Facing Page edition of Tommaso Campanella's Selected Philosophical Poems, published in two volumes uh, by the University of Chicago Press Poetry Series and also uh, Fabrizio Serra Editore, both in 2011. Sherry is the recipient of two undergraduate teaching awards. That's why we invited you. <laughs> Not all of those publications, of course, but the uh, Penn State Alumni Teaching Fellows Award, as well as the College of the Arts Award uh, for her courses primarily on Dante, medieval Renaissance, Italian literature and culture, and translation theory and practice. She is currently preparing the pioneering English translation edition of Jacopo Caliceo's prose romance, Peregrino. And you were going to be speaking yesterday, of course, about Dante. So, finding ourselves with Dante, to know you. So, Sherry, thank you. I would like to 
circle back in typical Dante fashion, and to take this end as yet another starting point for reflecting on this course, not so much from the perspective of the outcomes of the student budget in the AB, as before, but more from the perspective of the teacher, at least from my admittedly highly idiosyncratic perspective. Dante's texts have a message for teachers as well as students, a message that concerns the understanding of our responsibilities, boundaries, and potentials in our quests. The pedagogical intention of Dante's otherworldly journey moves from his promise to us to treat of the good that he found there to his concluding prayer to God to make his tongue so powerful that it may leave a single spark of his glory to the people yet to be. It is Dante's focus, and it can be a model for ours as well. Teaching is a mediation between one's understanding of an original text whose greatness exceeds any capacity to contain it, let alone efficiently pass it along to others, and the desperate need to do precisely that in a very different linguistic, political, social, spiritual context of 21st century America with respect to Dante's 17th century Italy. In our syllabi, we set requirements and expectations. Students will complete certain reading assignments by certain dates, demonstrate their understanding of Dante by means of exams, quizzes, projects, or papers. But the joy of teaching this course, what nourishes our sense of purpose, and what inspires us to do it over and over again cannot be found there. Our enrichment comes paradoxically in not focusing on those requirements and expectations of the students. I wish I could take credit for the mindset, but it derives from Dante's own writing. Just last week, I discussed with my most recent class the final culminating vision of Dante's Commedia, the passage from Paradiso 33, 133 and following, is justly cited and recited. Dante, the poet, endeavors to describe an understanding of the relationship between the human individual and the all. The part that begins, quale in geometra che tutto s'affige, but I'll only read the English translation um, of the Commedia from Robert M. Durling and the Vita Nuova by Mark Musa throughout. Like the, geomet like the geometer who is all intent to square the circle and cannot find for all his thought the principle he needs, such was I at the miraculous sight. I wished to see how the image fitted the circle and how it enwears itself there. But my own feathers were not sufficient for that, except that my mind was struck by a flash in which its desire came. Here my high imagining failed of But already my desire and the vele were turned like a wheel being moved evenly by the love that moves the sun and the other stars. Ci siamo, I might ask my students. That is, do we understand each other in this present? Are we with each other? E ci indoviamo. My cryptic title wishes to echo Dante's neologism. Are we going to enwear ourselves in that other world that Dante so polysemously offers, as well as in this world where we serve as teachers and guides? What <coughs> strikes me about these lines is Dante's recognition of his failure, manco possa, the lack of power of his high fantasy. Throughout the Paradiso, Dante describes a mystical poetic experience. But he also insists that paradise remains ineffable. Dante almost remembers what he saw, almost through similitudes and other figures recounts what he experienced, but only quasi. The genius of his poetry, I believe, is that in his admitted falling short of being able to put into words the fullness of his experience is an invitation to us to try to fill the gap no matter the knowledge or lack thereof that we bring to the poem at different stages of our careers. Dante always compels us to contemplate something even greater. Virgil, divinely sanctioned, leads Dante out of the dark wood and shows him the damned and the souls in purgatory, the temporal fire, and the eternal have you seen, my son, and you have come to a place where I by myself discern no further. 
Virgil's mancanza is Dante the Pilgrim's invitation to go beyond. Dante the Poet's mancanza in Paradiso 33 is our invitation to go beyond in our own contexts. Along these same lines, Dante seems to imply that our own role in passing along his legacy to future generations depends precisely on our mancanza, our inevitable falling short of conveying it all. In other words, being a Virgil in Dante's other world means recognizing our limitations and taking the students to a point from which they can go beyond. It is equally important that we realize that we are not diminished by this mancanza. Dante represented his journey through heaven as one of personal learning and growth through expansion. He understood the journey as both physical and metaphysical. For instance, in Paradiso II, Dante the Pilgrim arrives at the sphere of the moon. But it is not, of course, a moon landing for Dante. Heaven is not really a series of celestial bodies orbiting the earth, but rather a universe composed of nesting spheres, such that each higher sphere is larger and contains the others. Dante pointedly describes his absorption into the moon as a mystery akin to the hypostatic union of the Trinity. Learning, development, maturity all predicate recognizing that you are not now what you once were. You are changed. You have grown. For Dante, the transhumanar, that is, the being transhumanized, happens from this world. But what appears to him as a sudden and confusing change of place is in actuality a further entering into being. God, the greater good. As Dante continues to grow in understanding, he rises, sometimes almost imperceptibly, into the next sphere. At Paradiso 14, Dante notes that he saw himself translated into a higher blessedness. The individual who elects to try to embrace more understanding expands in spirit to a greater place. I'm reminded of another passage, this time from Vita Nuova. In chapter 12, Amor, the God of love, declares to his human disciple, I am like the center of the circle, equidistant from all points on the circumference. You, however, are not. No human perspective, not Dante's, not any given student's, and certainly not a teacher's perspective either, has that central right place. The radical leveling of the hermeneutic playing field, that is the way that Dante dramatizes the similarity of all of our interpretive quests, is positive, and it impels us forward with them. Coming to a fuller understanding of Dante's works, for most readers, is not about seizing on a single correct academic interpretation. It must be meaningful and on an individual level. And Dante accounts for the role of individual reader reception within his works, most tellingly in the episodes featuring Francesca da Rimini and Statius in his Commedia. Both attribute their destinies in the afterlife to texts they have read or misread during their lifetimes. The book could be the Galeotto of lust for Francesca or for Statius, the means by which he becomes both poet and Christian. Neither destiny is the result of following strict authorial intentionality. Dante's poetry seems to suggest that the way that we misread is a fundamental determiner of who we are and what we can be. If the human soul is eternal, then every day we live a part of that eternity. The stakes are very high and that we not get distracted and simply toss the book aside, a la Francesca, but instead continue to study, to indulge our curiosity, fascination, wonder, awe, and grow in understanding. Perhaps it's not a coincidence that I'm drawn to Dante's misreaders of texts, because I wish to conclude with, in my misreading, what I understand to be Dante's best advice to teachers. In Vita Nuova 18, if you'll recall, an unnamed gentlewoman addresses Dante, wishing to know what kind of love Dante can possibly hope to know with a woman whose very presence he cannot seem to endure. After all, people witness signs of Dante's emotional disruption any time Beatrice was near. But Dante promptly replies to her, 
The goal of my love once consisted in receiving the greeting, saluto, of this lady to whom you are perhaps referring. And in this greeting rested my bliss, saluta, which was the goal of all my desires. But since it pleased her to deny it to me, my Lord love, through his grace, has placed all my bliss in something that cannot fail me. When she asks him for further clarification, Dante declares that his bliss rests in those words that praise my lady. The gentlewoman redirects, pointing out the disconnect between Dante's theory and his practice. If you are telling the truth, then those words you address to her describing your condition must have been written with some other intention. She rightly assumes that Dante composed his previous poems in order to change Beatrice's feelings toward him or to prompt some other reaction from her, feelings of compassion, the offering of the salute again, or perhaps something more. Dante must admit that the gentlewoman's words provoke shame in him, so he resolves henceforth to write only poems of praise. After all, he recognizes that his joy comes from the intrinsic act of composing poetry in praise of Beatrice, not in the response. So what is Dante's advice to teachers? It is the same. Put your bliss in something that cannot fail you. In other words, do what gives you intrinsic joy without external conditions. For teachers, we cannot depend on a particular classroom environment, a steady enrollment, a certain level of preparedness from the students who come to class, or any other variable that might lead to frustration, because none of them are elements that we control. For me, other intrinsic factors must be my focus, my act of preparing for class, curating all the material that I've learned from past studies and previous students, and offering it as best I can in each lesson. These elements are within my control. I believe that the commedia, the allegorical medieval poem by a dead European white male, can be absolutely relevant to each of my students, and it's diverse, just as it has been for this blue-collar, first-generation college girl from the Mojave Desert with no Italian heritage, because we all bring something unique to its reading. And the repeated circling of the lectura dantes makes my own journey a dynamic, ongoing quest for growth. I am aware myself here in my bliss as often as I can with a new group of students, because it is different every time. I am different. And my own mancanza is, of course, an invitation to you to fill the gap. Thank you. I hear much, I hear much warmth in that applause. And, <laughs> and some of the, the conversation I did manage to catch over lunchtime was about how personal our presentations have, have been and the, the real joy of doing it. So, no more comment from me. I'm going to go off the run. I'm going to spoil the moment that we're all savoring here. Thank you, Sherry. Um, Ronald Hertzman is distinguished teaching professor of English at the State University of North at Geneseo, where he has taught since 1969. He has also taught at Georgetown University and Attica Correctional Facility. He has published widely on Dante and the visual arts and Dante and the Franciscans. Are you listening, Franco Romano? <laughs> He is the co-author with William Cook okay, uh, of The Medieval Worldview and with Rick Emerson of The Apocalyptic Imagination of Medieval Literature. Together with Cook, he was the first recipient of the Cara Award for Excellence in Teaching Medieval Studies from the Medieval Academy of America. He has directed 18 summer seminars for school teachers for the National Endowment for the Humanities, 15 of them on Dante and 12 of them in Siena. Ron is Director of Education and Outreach, fittingly, Dante Society of America.
that, I'm going to start with the question. Can anybody actually identify the location of this fine Dante mosaic? Yes. <laughs> yes, 42nd Street, Times Square. Uh, Subway game was a sort of nice <laughs> thing. <laughs> uh, so arguably, arguably the place where more cultures, religions, races, languages, and of course, fashion styles cross paths than maybe any place else on the planet. There we are in the bowels of the Times Square subway station. So I have this thought experiment uh, to the amazing talent shown by the buskers there, violinists, drummers, rappers, mariachi bands, acrobats, why not a daily lectura dantes? <laughs> now, again, I'm only half kidding uh, because it raises some really interesting questions about democratizing Dante. Uh, some of those violinists down there are, in fact, good enough to play in a symphony orchestra. Some of them actually do. Subway frolics may or may not help them pay the rent, but also, there's a kind of, hey, if I can do it here, I can do it anywhere quality, uh, kind of spirit to the enterprise a great boot camp for the big leagues. So can we do it the other way around? Just playing in the big leagues, which I take to be all the places where we Dantes normally do our teaching and learning, either in university, in college classrooms, or in print, give us the skill that allows us to go down into the subway and sing for an hour's supper. I love a well-crafted footnote as well as anyone. A uh, piece that, that Bill Stephanie and I submitted a couple years ago had 35 pages of footnotes, and I was almost as proud of them as I was of the text. <laughs> they had everything you would want in a footnote. Uh, little mini stories, not quite to the point of the real narrative, the occasional in-joke. Alas, what we have to do, it seems to me, is leave the safety net that a well-crafted footnote provides when we get down and dirty. And I guess it's almost inevitable that the grandest moments of high culture become a kind of shorthand to establish a barrier between us and them. Talking about Dante amongst ourselves is great fun, but maybe we need to be more inclined, more mindful of the vibe that it sends out, however unintentionally, that we have Dante and they don't. And we are therefore in and they are therefore out. So I guess uh, this talk tries to tease out some of the implications of uh, my experience, my experience with Bill Cook teaching Dante in Attica many years ago. My piece for the MLA volume is about some of the takeaways from that experience that they applied to my own teaching. I simply want to extend those thoughts in the direction of how they might apply to all of us in our attempts to democratize Dante. How far might we extend Dante outreach? When I taught in Attica, the most important takeaway was that Dante was for everybody. It turned me into a missionary in a number of ways, but I'm not sure that I made all of the connections that I should have. <clears throat> in writing about that experience, I said the following. One way in which they, our Attica students, were ahead of the game is that in Inferno, the characters that the pilgrim encounters are all liars. Our students' lie detecting radar was good enough to read the dramatic encounters in the text with great acuity. We put on to Francesca, for example, without our having to say anything. Because, of course, the default position of our inmate students was to assume that everything that they hear from anyone, especially those in authority, is going to be a lie. The basic contours of Dante's life as an exile gave them some reason to give him the benefit of the doubt once we showed how his exile and his poem are intertwined. So once they trusted Dante enough to give him a chance, they were able to get into the text. They put on to Francesca, for example, without having to say anything. She's putting the blame on somebody else. Because that's what I did. Because that's why I'm here. I did not perceive it at the time, but not only were they right in their intuition, that initial intuition enabled them to become our teachers. So much of what we hear, those of us who are not in the slammer, is in fact a lie. Advertising, politics, media, you name it, we're constantly being lied to. Outside the slammer, we have a harder time really and truly believing it than they do. 
For them it's second nature. For us it's an acquired disposition. Though I must say it's a bit easier for me and I venture to say us to understand it now than it was then. Uh, current political reality certainly put us a lot closer to our Attica inmates than I would have thought possible, let's say, hmm, three years ago. In other words, in crucial ways, they get the poem at a deeper level than we do. They see things that we don't. I did not draw the obvious conclusion of, until putting this talk together. Since Dante speaks to those at the margins, those at the bottom of the food chain, in a profound way, one good reason for going to the margins to introduce Dante is so we can learn from them what the poem is about. Those whose own condition is one of exile in obvious ways are in sync with the poem in ways that I am not. The takeaway that I am only now beginning to process is that we must head into this unknown territory to learn things in our bellies that we mostly process in our heads. Believe it or not, there still are some ungentrified parts of Brooklyn. Um, <laughs> one of them is Brownsville. Block after block of dream projects, maybe 25% of adults there have a high school diploma, a long way from the Brown Brownsville of Aaron Copeland, I. I. Rabbi, Zero Mostel, and Joe Pack. I've been teaching Shakespeare as a fellow all of my career. The best single discussion of race in Othello that I ever heard was in an eighth grade at a charter school in Brownsville. And my former students invited me to come to her class. Situations that are hypothetical for me were, duh, for these kids. And this certainly included discussions of sexual tensions. I was floored. And what is more, their intuitive understanding of what was going on enabled them to move into a discussion of some of Shakespeare's, Shakespeare's uh, more difficult rhetorical flourishes that I would have thought beyond the skill of eighth graders anyway let alone in the two floors of an old and decaying public elementary school, which had been marginally refurbished as a home for a class without a single white face. When we go into these classrooms, excited about what these students are going to teach us, we will have a better chance of teaching them. A couple of years ago, thanks in no small part to Dennis Mooney's groundbreaking work, my African-Americanist colleague Beth McCoy and I put together a course in Dante and African American Lit, What Happens If. After all, both Frederick Douglass and I both have, he had and I have a bust of Dante uh, in my study. I thought, okay, the obvious connection would be good enough to get us started in Exit to Israel Bay, Egypto. After all, does Dante speak for go down Moses, go down Egypt land until old Pharaoh let my people go? So it would provide me with a cover for the fact that I knew less about African American literature than every single one of the students in that class. Among other texts, we were reading W.E.B. Du Bois' The Souls of Black Folk in tandem with the comedy. I thought that Dante would provide a good lens for looking at Du Bois. He did. But what I had not anticipated was that it worked even better the other way around. Du Bois gave me a powerful lesson, a powerful lens for looking at Dante. Du Bois' deep dive into the horror of the political, social, economic, and religious conditions of slavery and of Reconstruction made me feel something in my gut that deepened my understanding of the reality of Dante's own exile during the last 19 years of his life. It was, quite simply, a way of making Dante's own exile more real and, more importantly, more relevant gave Dante flesh and blood. Both Dante and the boys look at the world from the bottom up. If we look at them right, they both have the capacity to shake us to the core. So I thought, the boys and Dante are coming at each other as intellectual equals, an equality that, as you can imagine, I do not easily grant. In that course, I got to stand back we all got to stand back and listen to them talk to one another. And I got to understand that we, my co-teacher Beth McCoy and I and the students in the class, 
we're doing pretty much exactly the same thing as Dante incarnates in the heaven of the sun, recreating, reenacting a dance which brings together texts and authors from different times and places, students and teachers who all have much to learn from each other in that tension between sameness and difference which Dante foregrounds in the sun and which describes all serious learning communities. How can we create that kind of community when we go out into the margins? I think at least in part, by recognizing the cliche that we learn from our students means nothing less than listening to the voices at the margins, not simply to give them a seat at the table, though that is a hugely important enterprise, but with the understanding that unless we somehow internalize their marginalization and frustration, we're not really getting the poem. Now that the Dante Society of America has made outreach and education more central, we need to think about pedagogical strategies for a variety of different contexts. But perhaps a more important question would be, how do we get there? How do we get a chance to go to the places at the margins, prisons, schools, the Brownsvilles of this world, nursing homes, the list is pretty long. We need to make sure that high school teachers certainly do get a seat at the table. Let's find a way to get a few of them on the National Council. They have far more to tell you than I do about what works and what doesn't work in the pre-collegiate classroom. And we need to have a forum that allows us more to listen to them. When I was working at the National Endowment for the Humanities, running the summer seminars for our high schools, Giles Constable, an eminent Harvard medievalist, was on the panel to pick seminar directors. His question was, when are we going to have NEH seminars for college teachers directed by high school teachers? That's a good question. My own great good fortune in directing 18 of these has led me into a number of high-end and not-so-high-end Dante classes, both as a guest teacher and as a guest guest. Uh, Barb Rosenblick, for example, who won the first Durling Prize, if you look up her course on the DSA website, we should all teach a course that is so carefully structured and that works at that level of sophistication. I came away from a Dante course at the Stony Brook School on Long Island, uh, taught by Eric Johnson. I asked myself if I saw any difference between that course and my own. I couldn't think of much. So I've had wonderful experiences lecturing to schools all across the country, and I've been similarly amazed. I could list a dozen experiences of being blown away by what I found in the classroom. Most recently, this, this December at Ball Places, the C.S. Lewis School in Bratislava. I'm making that up. And I must tell you this, closer to home at Geneseo Central School, for 15 years, one of my former NEH participants taught the Inferno for two months every spring to the entire 10th grade. Much more of a mixed bag. We have, at Geneseo Central, our share of faculty brats and sons and daughters of local lawyers also a lot of rural poverty. Some head off to Kenyan, some head, that is to say, the college, some head off to a community college, some lucky ones stay home and come to SUNY Geneseo, and some will never go near higher education when they graduate. Every year I give a guest lecture. One year, after giving what I thought was a particularly inspiring class on Ulysses, one of the 10th graders walked up to the desk and said the following, Mrs. Wilcox, did I get this right? Is he the guy who wrote that poem? <laughs> there are a variety of circumstances in which being mistaken for Dante would be a plus. Uh, I don't think this is one of them. <laughs> but what about Brownsville? How do we get there? How do we hang out there? How do we bring back Dante? Um, the question is not simply what we can teach them or what we can learn from them. The question is how we can find ways to get to them to offer our services for our sake as well as theirs. Thank you. Would this like Toda anyone so interested in being a uh, part of uh, Dante on call? Uh, just uh, for opener, send me an email.
Jay Hurston at Geneseo EDU. Uh, at this point, if I were Bernard of Clairvaux, I'd cut off pieces of my garment and throw it all out uh, to you. But uh, Ron Martinez reminded me that that crusade did not go very well. So uh, <laughs> uh, I will leave it at that. And subsequently, we'll all be getting instructions about you know, a little more of what we want uh, by way of uh, keeping you all online for what I think is really going to be an extraordinary enterprise. Thank you. I guess I'll put up our title slide again. This is a wonderful one, though, especially like the secondary colors surrounding it. But we'll go back to very much today. Good. So to conclude our panel, we have Jessica Levenstein, who is at the uh, Horace Mann School in New York and is head of the upper division at Horace Mann, where she teaches in the English department. Her scholarly work focuses on the classical tradition High Middle Ages and Renaissance, with particular emphasis on Dante's use of Ovid. She has published her work in a collection of essays on Dante and intertextuality, as well as in Dante studies, thank you, Italica, and the Chronicle of Higher Education. And Jessica's title for today is Albolo mi sentire crescere and Dante's Guide to Letting Go. Last year, one student wrote, 
will my dorm have air conditioning? <laughs> Another wrote, I'm gonna miss my mom's pasta. And finally, a third wrote, off we go. Goodbye, our childhood. In just six words, this student expressed the essence of his and his classmates and the ones. On the one hand, there's the enthusiasm of adventure and the unknown. Off we go. And on the other, the simple sadness of childhood's irretrievable loss. Goodbye, our childhood. When I teach Dante's work to students inhabiting that ambivalence, Dante's relationship with this guy and friend of Figure Virgil dramatizes these conflicting feelings and helps give shape to both my students' fears and desires for the future. Adolescents enmeshed in an ongoing recalibration of their relationship with their parents see Dante's behavior toward Virgil as a paradigm for the kind of toddling they have to do between meeting their parents and finding the strength to live without them. As Dante manages both to display respect for his epic forebear and to emphasize the distinction between the fictive Aeneid and the truthful Commedia, he models and legitimizes their own mutable, inconsistent stance toward their parents. The pilgrim's feelings for his maestro Aotore, admiring, grateful, and loving, are not unlike high school seniors' feelings for their parents, even if they don't always exhibit admiration, gratitude, or love. But Dante's effort to mark the difference between his narrative and Virgil's by insisting on the falseness of Virgil's poem and the truthfulness of his own, particularly evident when he sees Pierre de Lavinia in Inferno 13 and Manto in Inferno 20, also mirrors the necessary act of filial separation that my students are carrying out as they arrange for the next steps in their trajectory toward adulthood. Teenagers have little patience when lessons derived from their parents' experiences. They're eager to point out the differences between the world their parents grew up in and their own. In the fall of their senior year, these differences pertain particularly to the college admissions process, but also, importantly, to sexuality, gender, or other categories of identity. Observing Dante demonstrating respect toward Virgil and his work, at the same time that he maintains the superiority of his own perspective, gives students a model for expressing their individual intellectual, political, or moral differences from their parents' without entirely alienating themselves from them. The contradictions in Dante's relationship with his Dolce Padre connects most closely to my students' own familial drama as we read of Dante's journey to the top of Mount Virgil. While Virgil describes Dante as one without wings, Sansala, at the base of the mountain as he climbs Purgatory, the pilgrim grows increasingly ready to take flight. Getting closer to the top, on the terrace of lust, Dante compares himself to a baby stork, tentatively raising a wing only to lower it in fear. While the chikomi che leva l'ala per voli di volare, e non sa tenta di abbandonare il nido, e giù la capa. He can prepare to fly, but is too afraid of leaving his nest to take the plunge. Ascending to the earthly paradise, however, the pilgrim feels his wings growing. Al volo mi sentia crescere bene. Now he is ready to take off in flight, like a high school senior, eager to feel the freedom of independence, of adulthood. Just before Dante passes into the garden itself, Virgil, knowing he can no longer accompany his charge on his journey, bids him farewell. Prato to qui con ingegno e monarca, lo tuo piacere ormai cari caduce. Virgil has done the best he could, using his ingegno and his arte to smooth the way for Dante and to teach him what he needed to know to take the next step in his pilgrimage, to grow the wings that would carry him. That journey cannot include his God now. And he tells Dante, Non aspettar mio dire più ne mio cielo, libero dritto e sano, e tu arbitrio, e fa la foro non fare a suo seno, per chio e sovra te corono e parte di Virgil will no longer be by Dante's side to give him counsel or direction. Dante has what he needs to govern himself. His will is free and true, and he can trust it to lead him in the right direction. Students prepare for a similar scene at the gates of places that seem, in their imaginations, like their own paradises, can't help but be moved by Virgil's words. 
they too want to soar on newly fledged wings. And in the best version of these scenes of goodbye, their parents also acknowledge that they're ready to leave the nest. As my student wrote in his six-word memoir, off we go. And yet, just after he wrote those jubilant words, he added, goodbye, our childhood. Ready or not, students again recognize the ambivalence that characterizes their own struggle for independence when, just two contos later, Dante illustrates the emotional cost of the pilgrim's loss of his beloved guide. Beatrice has appeared before him. Overwhelmed by emotion, he turns to tell Virgil all he feels at the sight of her. Volsimi al sinistra color spito, col quale fantoni corre alla mano, quando ha paura o quando è afflitto. By Virgil is in there. Ma Virgilio la veo la sciacca scegli di sé, Virgilio dolcissimo patto, Virgilio a cui per me salute viene. Feeling himself to be in that moment, a fantoni in need of his mama, Dante belatedly recognizes that Virgil's speech was more than an expression of his faith in Dante's will. It was, of course, a leave to him, and Virgil is no longer by Dante's side, no longer able to safeguard his salute. His sweetest of fathers has left him alone, bereft. These lines take on a profound and painful meaning for the students in my class. Through the commedia, they're forced to confront the flip side of their exciting departure from home. Poised to experience the exhilaration of flight, they listen to the pilgrim's lament at the loss of his paternal guide, and must also come to terms with the heartache that accompanies their own impending journeys. Throughout their reading of the poem, students take in the poet's lessons about flying before they're ready, the pilgrim's identification and more jarring with Phaeton, tragically ill-equipped to manage his father's team, and Icarus, too tempted by the pleasures of flight to heed his father's warning, illustrate what can happen if adolescents test the limits of their independence too soon, ignore their parents' advice, or fly on false wings, unable to stay aloft. But at the earthly paradise, the pilgrim has been told his will is sound. He is no longer a satsama or afraid to abandon Apollonido. Thanks to Virgil's guidance, his flight won't end disastrously, like Phaeton's or Ingress's. Nevertheless, my students learn the pilgrim's freedom is also suffused with loss, just as theirs will be. And it's a loss that both child and parent bear again and again for a lifetime. Teachers to bear that loss. In a high school, we might meet a 14-year-old boy at the beginning of his ninth grade year. He's just about a growth spurt, so his pants are three inches too short, and his limbs move around like unknown, uncontrollable appendages. His skin has erupted, his handwriting is indecipherable, and his backpack's filled with crumpled up paper and perpetually damp gym clothes. Or we might meet a 14-year-old girl. She's using a long sheet of her hair to go incognito. She covers her mouth with her hand and she laughs, so no one sees her braces. And she uses three different color felt-tip pens to annotate her course books, each color representing a concept revealed by an elaborate key she's constructed on the title page. In the next four years, these students' teachers will comfort these children when they cry over a bad grade or a broken heart or the divorce of their parents. They'll cheer these children on when they sing at the chorus concert or score a goal in a water polo match or defend an idea with evidence and eloquence. At the end of these four years, the boy and the girl walk across the stage at graduation, resembling nothing if not men and women, and their ninth grade selves are barely discernible behind their clear skin and beaming, confident smiles. They pose for pictures with their teachers in their caps and gowns. They promise to visit their winter break, and they say goodbye. Unlike Purero Latini, crying out, qua maravilla at the sight of his former student, we don't usually see them again. <laughs> the first time or two that a teacher experiences that loss, it's confusing. It feels embarrassing and inappropriate. These are teachers' students, not their friends or their children. But the emotional and intellectual investment in them is real. And Virgil's claim to have brought Dante to the top of purgatory with Ingenio and Arte is the teacher's claim too. Virgil's pride when he crowns and mitres the pilgrim is the teacher's pride too. We guide them to the top of step, tell them they're ready, and hope their new wings will carry them. 
In the second trimester, after they finish reading Dante with me, the students move on to a class that might be totally unrelated, a poetry writing elective or a trimester long study of Moby Dick. In college, they sometimes continue their study of Dante, and often they do not. They've learned something, however, about the rewards of confronting a work or idea that is profoundly alien to them. They've learned to manage the discomfort caused by the unfamiliar and to use resources to make sense of what they don't understand. They've learned to approach a literary work from its point of intersection with what they do know or care about. Moreover, in reading Dante in high school, my students surprise themselves by finding in the story of the spiritual journey of a medieval Italian exile an analog to some of their own ventures in the modern world. They experience the thrill of reaching the next steps in the journey, and they feel the poignancy of what they lose along the way. The gaps in language, religion, location, and historical context fall away until all they're left with is the human experience, the ongoing quest to find their voices, to find their paths, and to find a meaning larger than themselves. The teacher finds this meaning as well. Just as Virgil bids farewell to Dante outside of the earthly paradise, the teacher says goodbye on graduation day, confident that her students can fly on their own now, certain that they'll continue to learn and grow with new teachers in new places. She has learned through Dante's call how to let go. The summer passes, and from time to time, the teacher scans the sky for flapping wings. They're growing ever more distant. Then she turns back to her copy of the Commedia and gets ready for September. Exactly about your paper, which I love, but it's about Dante on demand. Uh, yes. Or Dante, how did you call it? Dante on well, we're doing Dante on call. On call. Unless there's a ground swell to change it to Dante. Well, <laughs> what are you thinking about? What are you envisioning? If you don't mind, just taking a minute to talk about that. It's a work in progress, obviously. What we're envisioning, and I would ask Matt Homer to join in here, is that number one, we have a pretty large size cohort of folks who are experienced teachers of Dante who are willing to essentially do volunteer work in whatever context is called upon uh, to bring Dante to places where Dante ordinarily does not get to go. So anything that works toward that end, uh, we will shamelessly use. And so for this initial step, what we really want to do is uh, put together the list and then see what we have. In other words, are we covering all of the geography of the, of the country? Are we, uh, you know, sufficiently large number uh, that we sort of feel confident in keeping this as a going concern? Uh, but, uh, you know, essentially, uh, we're going to learn by doing. All right. Thank you. Can I put in a plug for Dante on Demand? <laughs> because it sounds like HBO On Demand. So it's the demander is the person who wants Dante to come. So I, I, that plus the alliteration, I would go with that. Albert? <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, you said Senator Sudamandi, but I think that's a misconstrual. The demander is the person who wants Dante to come as an HBO on I, I will listen to the Bronx Coffee. <laughs> yeah. In any case, uh, all I wanted to add is that as a practical matter, really what we're talking about is creating a resource um, uh, that can be found on the website with a list of people in the different areas, possibly with the topics they're willing to talk about, but I think more generally, simply qualified people in one way or another who would be willing to go and talk to high school classes, junior high school classes, uh, nursing homes, uh, book groups, um, just, just to have a resource that people could consult. And I don't think we would be going out trying to sort of match make exactly. Uh, we would hope that um, partly uh, by going to the membership and, and finding people who are willing to do this, we would also go to those members who might be interested in using the service because happily it's a, an organization composed of people who love Dante uh, but are not necessarily experts and others who are experts in one kind of one way or another. So it's an experiment because uh, uh, it's not exactly clear how the word will get out, but we're trying to take some steps. And, and I think one, one thing that Ron and I were talking about earlier is that I think that in identifying people who are already doing this, and many of you already are, uh, let's be clear about that, um, we may learn lessons that can be passed around uh, that, uh, uh, as we are today, listening to those of you who've taught in different kinds of settings and in different in different ways. So, any thoughts, people? Uh, in the first instance, we're about to we'll send out a call to ask people who might be interested in being on such a list. Uh, but um, if you have suggestions about ways that we could develop it, um, uh, that would be great too. So. It's a great initiative. I connected immediately with uh, what you said, that <clears throat> such little kids don't want to go to rooms and uh, or, uh, and uh, share toilets and all this stuff. I don't think I'm going to I have a grandson uh, who quit high school because he didn't like the raw raw stuff. His brother was going to Villanova, which is even more raw raw than this one. <laughs> and uh, he would have no, no part of that. Uh, so he self educated himself and did brilliantly uh, and was accepted at uh, a bunch of colleges, uh, the University of Vermont for the ecology program, and uh, in Canada, the University of Vancouver, and so on. Uh, here's the point. He uh, refused to accept the scholarships from any of them unless they agree to let him live off campus in his own uh, little place, whatever it is. Uh, and they just adamantly refused. Uh, but uh, one of them, the University of Montana, the University of Montana State, allowed him to do that. He had, when he quit high school, built his own little cabin in the backyard of his parents' place and hold up there. Here's, here's the point. This kid has guts. Right? He is just not intimidated by anything. Uh, I don't see that in Dante uh, when he's speaking for me. Uh, there's not this element of, uh, of rebelliousness. Uh, on the contrary, he's, he's stalling out and he needs uh, to be cut loose by the sword of and my sense is that he doesn't really realize that he's lost Virgil until he's confronted with his absence when he turns to him in front of Beatrice. I mean, so there is a kind of sense that he's a bit oblivious at that moment to so how deep that loss is going to be. I always experience the way he feels then to the way an adult child feels about losing a parent. 
by then, you know all their flaws. He knows all of your Gino's flaws. You love them anyway. It's a, it's a completely different moment in life. He's not analogous to your grandson. He's analogous to us losing our parents. Um, I, I think. I think that's, that's much closer to what that moment is about. He's already been with Elvis. Right. He's already done a bunch of stuff with your Gino earlier in the poem. I mean, I, yeah, I mean, we, yeah. I, I feel like there are two moments of that there. And the first is Virgil's, when he is bidding farewell to Dante. That's, 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 you feel Virgil's emotion in that moment. And then it's Dante's emotion later. So they, they're not feeling it simultaneously. There isn't this kind of mutual leave taking moment. I fought with my mother my entire life. She's now 92. It will be dolcissima notte when we get to that point. I, I just think it's a completely different situation. see that you, there's interest, there might be passion, there might be understanding, but you don't know what kind of difference you can make. No, I, uh, I, I'm, I'm really curious. I mean, just, First thing I would say is I'm not sure that differentiates it from any other kind of teaching sure, that you okay. do, where, uh, you know, uh, there are a lot of interesting scenarios where you never know or get some clue much later down the line about something you never thought you had. But I would say that one of the things that I think I might use to tie in uh, with, with the experience on the high school level was that the students, let's say, in Attica, their sense of seeing themselves ratified in a set of uh, you know, that they, it never occurred to them that there would be documents that would talk about this sort of stuff. And so I think that learning that is powerful in itself and also enabled them uh, to go after the text with a great deal more energy and enthusiasm. In other words, seeing that, by golly, this thing does have something to say to me meant that they really attacked it with a vengeance. And it meant that they were to some extent able to overcome certain lacks in, in, in formal education uh, so that you kind of start, you know, typically I might in a Geneseo class start with a piece of text and work outwards. Here, starting with an experience and working into the text meant that, that all of a sudden they had a little bit more confidence in unpacking what would be rhetorically very, very difficult to somebody who, you know, may have, even though they had their GED diploma, uh, um, their reading level was not as high as an as average student in my normal class. So I think that kind of interplay was something that I noticed. I don't know Bill would with me about that, or would have other things to say about what, you know, what they got out of it. 
I was going to make a practical comment. I can just move a little bit away from what Ralph was saying. And that is, you know, we, we hear it's a lot on television all the time that it's okay. Go, go, go. It's Stand really up. difficult to hear up We hear all the time. Stand up. Stand up. Stand up. I'm getting the table Stand now. Right. Uh, that we read all the time or see on television that teachers, you know, are spending their own money to buy notebooks and pencils for their students. Well, imagine you have a teacher who might think about incorporating Dante into a class. Where's she going to get 25 copies of the Divine Comedy? And, I, and because the school is very likely not to buy them. So I think one very practical thing to think about is practical things to do, and then perhaps to circulate the word. In, hey, teachers, in, in some way, through a, through a union newsletter or whatever it might be, if you're interested in teaching Dante, we'll, we'll get you the text. And I think that might be a useful thing to think about as a practical way of trying to get into certain schools. I'd like to thank all three of the speakers for a very, very interesting uh, series of talks. It seemed to me that actually the papers meshed very, very well in the sense that the, it, the call or demand for Dante is the unifying theme that just was speaking to an audience of people for whom the poem is to describe events that are about to happen or are in the process of happening, whereas what Sherry was uh, describing the ethical, uh, the ethical engagement that the poem can provide might also speak very well to that other audience, to the audience of people who are selfishly or speaking at retirement age, people who want to take Dante and continuing education courses. And one of the things that I would really uh, like to know is if we can establish a fund of information about how we, how we interest universities. Mine is an example in supporting these sorts of uh, continuing education courses. Uh, they sell out all the time whenever they are offered, and yet for, at least in the case of the University of Warwick, they have absolutely no interest whatsoever in providing more than just the most nominal of uh, support, maybe space, uh, and they even are grudging about that. But it seems to me that that's the future. That's the future of Dante's studies. It's the future of all the humanities. Uh, the older people who want to come back and relive their experience as students in college, and the new students, the students who are about to go to college and pursue their studies there. So I thought that they actually they emerged very nicely around that central focal point of Dante as a continuing a, uh, a continuing concern for everybody. Is there another comment here? I was thinking, Christina, we had to envision a copyright here. Yes. Did you do that? Yes. Or did you want to do any other here? Well, depending on how we're feeling here. More questions. We were, Chris and I were thinking that we could break now until 4, and then resume at 4 for our final response, and then we'll have our presentation. Yeah, so we'll take another break and then so come take, back. Unless anybody has more questions, we'll take a break now for 15, come back at 4 o'clock and we'll do our response. Thank you.